Hey everybody here, Todd McFarland here. We're back for another session of our Artist Spotlight. And uh, today I have the great pleasure of dealing with Mr. Mark Brooks, uh, one of the preeminent cover artists, uh, just artist period uh, in our industry. Um, but he's gonna be doing a series of covers for us. And like in the past, less concerned about talking specifically uh, about those covers, although we will get to some of those. Um, but more sort of concerned and curious about Mark's uh, career and how he got here. I'm always, I know people ask me about my sort of path. I'm always curious about everybody else's. I, I think everybody has a, their own personal journey, which are fascinating. Uh, and anyways, we'll we'll see if we can delve into that. So uh, Mark, welcome aboard today. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. It's uh, good to talk to you. Yeah. And so... You know what? Again, let's just start sort of at the beginning. That you know, breaking into comic books to me is like I mean, you know, it's a it's a it's a hard it's a hard nut to sort of get into. I mean, once once we get there, then you've got another one, which is can you stay and can you basically be relevant? I guess uh, within the industry uh, that we're there, but. Um, but uh, how 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 did you catch your lucky break, right? Because every yes, the first time I think is a is a lucky break for all of us. No, it's absolutely true. I mean, um, I think I did what a lot of people did, uh, which is when I broke in, the internet was in its infancy, um, so there wasn't really a, a, a way online where you could go and interact with editors and things like that. So for me, it was all about conventions. Um, we had a big show. Where, where, so where were you living at this time? Oh, Atlanta. I'm in Atlanta. Okay. Yeah. So we had a big show, which is not so comic driven now, but at the time it really was called Dragon Con. Right. And uh, and all of you guys used to come to the shows. Uh, you know, you were there. Jim Lee had been there before. Uh, we have Guys in Studios, which is a local studio here with like Cully Hamner and Adam Hughes. And uh, I used to go to these conventions, mainly Dragon Con, and take my my portfolio of subpar comic artwork and i would go and talk to artists and i would get critiques and and just anybody i could get it in front of uh yeah. just to give me advice um that's what i did and, until uh i finally went to wizard world chicago one year and i met with uh dreamwave and devil's do who at the time were at image and they were working on transformers and gi joe and i ended up getting work from both those companies in the same convention uh and oh wow yeah. So you got you got two yeses in in one at one convention. At one convention, yeah. You look at you, big shot. No, it, it was it was a big it was a big convention for me. Um, I I walked out of there super duper happy. Um, what, were, what were can I? Do you mind me asking? What what was your what was the sample? Were you showing them black and white? Were you showing them color? What were you showing them at that point? Um, I was actually showing them black and white. Uh, what's really funny is I was I was there staying with a bunch of artists I had met online at the time. Uh, it was uh, Scotty Young, I'm sure you've heard of, uh, John Samariva, Greg Titus, and there were guys like uh, Sean Gordon Murphy. Uh, we had all kind of met, and so we were all kind of hanging out together. And that same weekend that I got those two gigs, John Samariva sat down and taught me how to color in Photoshop. Oh wow! Yeah, so it was it was a big uh, it was a big weekend for me. Um, and for, for some of you listening today uh, that maybe aren't quite as familiar uh, with Mark's work as you should be, uh, yeah. he does fully rendered painting. That's why I'm asking that question where I, I just came in and wanted to be a penciler and that was sort of it at the beginning of it. Uh, Me so too. I'm, always, I'm always curious with people who do render their own colors and or painters like yourself, how that process began, right? Whether it was there from the beginning um, or whether it was just an evolution that got you there? It was evolution, honestly, because when I broke in, I, I didn't know what um, what would be popular, what wouldn't be popular. I knew who I idolized. And I idolized guys like you, um, you know, J. Scott Campbell, Joe Maduera, Jim Lee, Mark Silvestri. So I thought I had to have this kind of like cartoony style, um, you know, uh, it's a little more exaggerated. So, what, what, what year is this? I don't know. If, well, this would have been 2000 and 2001, 2002. Okay. Okay. Um, so my style was was just basically penciling. I just wanted to pencil. And it was very like exaggerated and cartoony. But the thing was, is that when I was in high school in art college, 
I love drawing like realistically. I love painting, working at pastels and things like that. But yeah. I didn't think that stuff would fly in comics. I thought it was it needed to be like what you guys were doing. Yeah, big bombastic, I call it. So. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and it wasn't until uh, a few years I had been working that I started seeing stuff by like uh, Alex Ross, you know, um, uh, Travis Charest, this kind of very realistic looking style yeah. and i was like oh this counts you can do this in comics and so i realized that when i was well i i idolized you guys i was trying too hard to be you guys yeah. and that i needed to be more true to myself and so i i started like allowing myself to let the real me come yeah. through in my artwork and it just that's, slowed a, that's a big I mean, mark i've had this conversation you know this Mm -hmm. I, I would argue that that, I mean, there's a couple of hurdles getting in, staying in, but finding your style, right? And I mean, you're by the collective, all of us, our styles, mm -hmm. because we know we're going against the sea of other artists, right? And if you look like a hundred other artists or worse, you're doing a poor man's version of mm -hmm. dozens of other artists it's easy to get lost, right? And the way to get noticed is to do at least not, yeah, I don't know that anybody's wholly original because we're all just amalgamations of what we see, mm -hmm. but uh, at least putting together your style that people feel like, oh my gosh, I, I haven't seen that on every other book, right? right. Um, and so again, you know, I see portfolio to this day where, you know, I get that artwork, it's, it's competent, it's solid, it's functional, but I've seen it a, a hundred times, if not thousands of times. And I'm just looking for one thing in their page to get them to basically, you know, differentiate themselves from the pack, right? Like what's their anchor basically? Like yeah. what makes them, I, 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 I was at a convention um, a few weeks ago and I was doing a panel with uh, Mitch Gerard's and we were talking about style. And one of the questions we got was, you know, how do I develop my style? And I I brought up that a style is like a mutant power. You know, you you maybe you want to fly. You maybe you want to grow wings and fly because you saw another artist that grows or mutant that grows grows wings and flies, but that might not be you. You're not gonna know until you let your style naturally develop. You may not grow wings and fly. You may turn invisible. You may shoot fire out of your mouth. Yeah. You don't know what your mutant power is gonna be. You can't force it though. You it, the the more you try to force it, the longer it's gonna take. Yeah, I've always I've always said, Mark, that I could dissect my style and sort of show the influences of 25 different people, mm -hmm. right? There's the machinery guy. There's the cape guy. There's the action guy. There's a the woman person. There's and the, and and so I was like I was pulling a piece and a piece and a piece and a piece from all of them. But when I put it into the blender and mixed it all together, mm -hmm. that became my own cocktail, right? Even though the, the again, it was I was using parts of everything that in my mind preexisted. Nobody put it together in that combination. So then it becomes our style. Right. So again, have people do people do realistic stuff? Yes. Do they do painting stuff? Yes. Do people do it uh, uh, with like within comic books? And I say yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. But when you do yours, then it's oh, that's Mark Brooks, right? right. Um, and that that's to me is like when because look at when you were young. Remember, you would be able to look at a comic book, and without even knowing what the credits were. There are still plenty of people you knew who drew it or oh, inked it or color, right? And to me, that I go, man, if I could ever get to the point that they know my work before my name, mm -hmm. just like I do, right? Then that yeah, I thought that was like the nirvana that you go, oh man, that'd be that'd be super cool. So you've obviously accomplished that. That you know, people, you know, I I I just say, hey, I, I got Mark Brooks doing artwork, bam, right? They already have the picture in their head. That's that's the key to longevity to me, you know, is it, it's one thing to do great artwork, but like you said, about it's it's breaking in and staying in or, or or like it's to me, it's getting invited to the party and then earning the right to stay at the party. And the, one of the big for you, the first hurdles is your name, you know, that, that, that getting people to become household names, not the word, because let's face it, comics are kind of a small market, but 
you know, within that market is having your name have enough recognition that people instantly can imagine something like you said, imagine something in their mind and yeah. know what to expect or be able to look at a piece of artwork and go, I know that's Todd McFarlane. I know that's Mark Brooks. I know that's Alex Ross or whoever, you know. Yeah, I, I, would, I would argue any artist, I don't care whether it's music or or acting or, you know, art or whatever, the the to your point, the key to the longevity is being relevant, right? Because if you're not, then in the music world, you're gonna be that one that sort of hit, you know, boys to men, you know, that hit it big, 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 everybody knew who they were. And then, right. and then, and then a, a crash down where, you know, Rolling Stones, I, I would argue, I've said to people, I, I admire what the band Kiss has done, mm -hmm. not, from a musical point of view, we can argue about their musical chops. That's another debate. They came in in the 70s and they're still here in what are shark infested waters, mm -hmm. right? Any any competitive art field, any, any field period uh, is filled with competitors. And so how do you not only rise above it, but do it for decades, right? That like, and once you can get that to me, I, I tip my hat to anybody who's been in any field for like 30, 40 years. Cause I know how difficult it is. You know how difficult it is now, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it ebbs and flows. And this is why, you know, I, you know, the one, the one, the best compliment I can get from a fan is, wow, you've come so far and, or wow, you've gotten so good or wow, you leveled up because as well, much well. as, you know, I like, I like what I do and I like how I, how I draw, but I'm not satisfied, mm -hmm. you know? And I think that, that, a lack of satisfaction uh, in my artwork and always wanting to push it and always wanting to get better. That's what's going to keep me at the party. Yeah. You know, I, I would, I would guess Mark that every artist for the most part is fairly neurotic like yeah. us in which we're chasing the elusive perfected perfection on, on paper. Mm -hmm. And then we die before we ever get there. But, we're, but the whole quest, the whole life, is for that one moment that never arrives, but but we always think it's tomorrow, right? Tomorrow is going to be my best piece, and then even if you do something really good, you go, oh, I can do a little bit better the next day, can I? Right? Well, uh, I always say if someone says, "Do you like this? Do you like that piece?" and I said, "Yeah, I really do like it," but give me fifteen minutes. <laughs> you know, I'll start finding ways. I, and what what was it, uh, Da Vinci or Michelangelo? One of these old classic Renaissance artists. He said, "No piece of artwork is ever finished, only abandoned." Yeah. And I have always liked that because as, as production artists, you know how it is. No, I, deadlines. I, deadlines. Some point, oh. One of the great inventions of the world is deadlines. Because I think most of us would be working on our first project still noodling it. Absolutely. Still, still trying to get the, the elusive perfection. So, yeah. okay. So now let's just jump to the color then. So now somebody, you're saying somebody's teaching you how to do color or what? Yeah. Uh, uh, because I got work with Dreamwave and Dreamwave had kind of like, they the, their Transformers books already started coming out and they were very uniquely colored. They were done with that kind of like anime cell style. Yeah. And uh, so I was, and when you know they talked to me about doing some work for them, I was like, well, I want to be able to color like that too. And my friend John, who was already a very a pretty accomplished colorist and, and artist, uh, sat down with me and over the course of like three hours taught me the ins out of ins and outs of Photoshop. And I penciled and colored up piece of Optimus Prime just right there that night and I, just a simple shot of Optimus Prime it probably took me eight hours to color him because I was still I was just figuring it out but I spent that eight hours just using the basics John taught me to just teach myself at that point so so I can see behind you so what are the tools that you and have you changed over the years of the tools that you began with and the tools you use today uh yeah somewhat um when I started, like I said, it was just pen and ink um, and, you know, pencil. And uh, I started seeing artists that were started working in markers a lot. Um, you know, Adam Hughes was one of them. But a lot of artists were like working with these cool and warm gray markers. So they were doing their artwork still in black and white, but it was super rendered. And then they would color it in Photoshop. And so I started trying to do a little bit of that. Like, so I would pencil and ink it. And then I would add like these tonal grays to it. And took that into Photoshop and then and colored it that way. And then I had other artist friends who were seeing me do all this like renderings. I got very good at the rendering. 
Um, they were like, you know, you're only one step away from just doing full color pieces. Just take what you're doing and just add color, you know? And now it was a little harder than that because we're talking about volume as yeah. opposed to like saturation and hue and all that stuff. So that took a whole other turn, but they were for the most part, right. Because when the rendering's all done, all you have to worry about is the hue and the saturation, you know, and, and, you know, yeah, I just started gradually adding color into it. The, the other problem is though, is that when you first start doing this stuff, it takes a long time to get good at it. So when you first start, you're slow. Yeah. So I, you know, it wasn't like I was pen pencil and inking a cover yeah. one day and the next day I was just doing all these marker yeah. rendering. I would, I just kind of slowly kind of started working it in every once in a while until it's I got the one, it. It's the one, it's the one piece I think that fans neglect at times, right? Mm -hmm. So that, that you have like, you have like Mark Brooks, the, the penciler over here, and he's been doing it now for whatever length of time. So you've mm -hmm. gotten a little bit more proficient. And then you go, okay, I'm going to ink my own stuff or whatever. I'm, you know, and then you get proficient. And then you're a year into it, two years, and then you're going to color. But somehow they they put that two years of evolution of those others and think that you're two years into it right. at the moment that you do it. For me, it was when I did uh, the first Spider-Man book and I did this story called Tor Torment. Mm -hmm. And people went, Todd, you're not a very good writer. And I'm like, no kidding. It's my first issue, right? <laughs> but 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 because it was Todd McFarlane, the, the established artist, mm -hmm. they just made the leap that somehow that I picked up writing that I now had seven years of experience of writing that caught up in one day to my artwork. And it was like, no, I, the, the yeah. writing is going to always be seven years lagging behind, right? So a Absolutely. I mean, that that's the thing. It's like when, when I'm sure you, well, I don't know how many, because I know when you go sign at conventions, you're very busy. You probably don't have time to look at anybody's artwork, but I'm sure back in the day you did. Um, and when I look at uh, uh, artists' artwork that we're trying to break in, they're always like trying to do everything. Yeah. By the way, like they bring these fully penciled, inked, and and rendered and colored pieces, and I'm like, but you're weak at all three of them. Like you, you, you're not. They're not, you know, accomplished. Like good penciler, but your inks and colors need work. It, it's obvious they've been trying to do all three at the same time, yeah. and so all three suffer. And so I'm like, what do you want to be? And they're, I'm like, do you want to be a penciler? Do you want to pencil comics? Like, yes. I'm like then pencil because every single minute you spend inking and every minute you spend coloring could have been a minute you spent working on your pencils. Yeah. So put that stuff aside. You can learn that later. Take yeah. one step at a time and start at the beginning. Or or the other piece, uh, the other advice I give up to that person and I've run in there, I go, if you're going to do all of it, and it, again, like to your point, not my recommendation, but if you're going to do it, then when you're done with your pencils, make a copy. And then when you ink it, make a copy. And then when you color it, make a copy. And then when you letter it, make a copy. And the reason is because if you make a copy, you got a chance to show me that you want to apply for one of four jobs, right? right? The chances of you being proficient and a professional at all four of those jobs on the same day, I'm telling you, that those those unicorns rarely show themselves, right? Really but, but to your point, you may be bad penciler, bad uh, inker you, you can't really letter but man look at the you you have a sense of color right mm. so we'll we'll can we give you a job in which we're going to break you in coloring somebody else's artwork while you get better at those other trades on your own time and then you can introduce them right mm -hmm. but you come at me with all four of them i'm going to judge them as a collective whole and right. the chances of you being a major leaguer at four positions at the same time is very remote. So give yourself a fighting chance and break it all up because you might not even know. You may want to be a penciler, mm -hmm. but you may be the best letter in the industry in three years for all we know. If you should like, but at least at least you're in our business, and that's the first step. Get get on the field, and then worry about everything after that. Right. Get in the party. <laughs> that's it. That's right. And stay. <laughs> And stay, and stay. stay to your point. So, <laughs> so now, uh, so uh, and then and just go back uh, in terms of the the tools. And I understand the and maybe I didn't make my question specific. But when you started doing color, you began with markers and you stayed in that realm the whole time. 
No, I mean, I, I, I started with markers and, you know, I transitioned over to color with markers, but then I, I, I realized that I wanted to, I wanted my artwork to be richer and there's only so many things you can do with, um, with, with markers. So I started incorporating uh, acrylic ink into it, which is, um, it's a, it's a transparent acrylic ink. So any kind of rendering you have underneath that, that color you put on, you put down with a brush is going to show through. Um, and it's really, really handy. You could do some really cool things with it. So I started incorporating that. Um, I'm doing a lot of like colored pencil work with like um, Prismacolors or Polychromos. So at this point, my my artwork is just, it's a mishmash of all different kind of materials. Um, it's basically, I, I'll do uh, gouache sometimes, acrylic gouache, um, you know, just anything I can get my hands on. If, if it works, it works, you know. Um, uh, once, look at, for me, I was in the industry for three, four years or whatever. Mm -hmm. I don't even remember. But when I finally was able to tell my mom, I'm drawn to Hulk, right? That was, that was when I remember she was like, oh my gosh, you've made it, right? Even though I've been in it for, like, I wasn't getting paid one penny more. Right. right. It was, but, but because it was something that was recognizable uh, either within the community and or in this case outside the community because it was a big work. Um, what what work, how long were you in the industry before you did sort of your your breakout moment, we'll call it, right? Where you just go, oh my, the people were coming, you didn't even, might not have even known, the people were coming up to you afterward going, oh, I really like that or whatever it was. Did you go, oh, I guess they're paying attention, right? I definitely had that moment. Um, I uh, I had been working at Dreamwave and Devils Do, uh, but Dreamwave had folded at this point, and I was doing some work with Udon, who uh, was doing some work with Marvel, but they also had the Street Fighter license with Capcom. Yep. So I was doing some work with that, and uh, and I I was at Wizard World, and I met Bill Jameis uh, through Eric Coe, who was who ran Udon, and I showed him my work, and I had done some like Marvel work for fun, and. I was competent enough at this point, but I had also hooked up with a digital painter named Danimation, who we just kind of hit it off really well. And he's an amazing digital painter. So Marvel said, okay, well, let's give you a trial script. Um, they were going to launch this book called Marvel Age Spider-Man, where they took the old Stan Lee scripts from the original Amazing Fantasy. Oh, yeah. they, had, they had another writer punch it up. So it's a little more modern, but it's still the base. It's still the Stan Lee story. And then uh, Dan and I, I did the pencils and Dan did the digital colors. And I didn't know that this was the reason they were doing this, but they were shopping around a book that was aimed towards kids. Mm -hmm. So we did the first issue, not knowing it was set for publication. They took that first issue and they apparently went to a retailer conference where Walmart and Target and all these other places were there. And so Walmart and Target loved it, said they want to do it in a magazine format. And can they get three more issues? And so Marvel came back. It's like, we need three more issues. Um, so I said, okay. So I, I did all those. Dan colored them or painted them. And we come to find out that that year, uh, the, the number two issue became the free comic book day issue. Oh. Um, and Walmart and Target had ordered all these copies of it. And basically, I had ended up launching this like new kids line of comics and I had no idea that's what I was doing. I thought I was trying out for Marvel. And next thing I know, like I said, free comic book day. I'm doing a signing at a store free comic book day. Oh. I'm seeing my books at Walmart and Target. Yep. I've only been working at Marvel for all of a year and a half at this point. Wow. Um, so, and then, and that was my, I had the same moment you did with my dad. I called my dad and said, dad, I'm drawing Spider-Man. And that's when I saw, I, I could tell it clicked with him. Like, oh, yeah. I know who that is, you know? <laughs> Oh, so you can pay the rent now. <laughs> yes, absolutely. But like you said, I wasn't getting paid any more oh. than I was gotten paid before. But it, yeah. it 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 took me to a whole new plateau. Um, yeah. that that I then spent. I uh, feel like I've spent the rest of my life trying to stay there, <laughs> not getting pushed off. You know. So so now then, uh, sort of walk us through now, sort of the the last big piece of your career that. 
with the, with the internet, right? I think the internet has changed because again, I, the competition is grander. I mean, we're, we're going against, you know, global artists now, right? I've always said, good thing I got in before the internet because I would have been left on the side of the road. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be able to, you know, at least be given a few years to get better, right? But now talent is unbelievable, right? Right, almost right out of the gate. It's, it's. I, I, I keep saying it's the, you know, I've been around almost 30, 40 years now, whatever. Um, and I, I think there's more talent now. When I, when I go up and down, out, you know, artist alley, or I look on the internet, like the, the depth of talent mm -hmm. is staggering. Is staggering. The, the, I would argue the problem still becomes the same though. Mm -hmm. That now, if everybody's basically, you know, Michelangelo, uh, then how do you again stand out? Right. I mean, and so, so, and that leads me to my question where somehow you have been able to figure out, I think what is a, a pretty steep hill. I, I, I maybe most people just think, ah, but I, I, I know how steep that hill is. I've been able to say, I'm going to become a cover artist, lots of cover artists out there. Right. Because you only have to do like one image and you can call yourself a cover artist where interior, you got to do 20 pages, not as many interior artists. Um, but you're now a cover artist with renown, right? Which is not easy, right? Because you start to say, well, who are the people we know as cover artists? And I mean, you, you, you start to stammer pretty quickly. Um, so how did, how do you think you were able to build your career, your reputation along the way to where we're at today with you? You know, it's a, that's a good question. Um, some of it, I mean, I can give you an answer. And some of it, it's 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 just like I I kind of don't know. <laughs> but <laughs> but um, it's okay. I mean, dumb luck works. Yeah, I mean, it is kind of dumb luck in some ways. But I do feel like in the beginning, when I really started focusing heavily on on covers, Marvel put me on a lot of books that weren't high sellers. Like they weren't putting me on X Men or Avengers. I was working on Fearless Defenders or Deadpool. And with Deadpool, it was a comedy book, right? Yeah. So the covers can be a little more like out of left field, a little weirder. Like you can go silly with them almost. So I think that that started with that, that it allowed me to, to kind of showcase a storyteller's mode with a little bit of humor um, with that. And then when I did Fearless Defenders, it was a very like under the radar book. So they said, you know, kind of do whatever you want so I said okay well what I want to do for this book is every cover I want to I want to cover a different area of pop culture so one cover looks like an action figure package like the the blister card you know and it's kind of yeah. up the picture of Danny Moonstar another one looked like the startup fight screen and the choose character screen from a from a video game um you know and one of them looked like a Russian propaganda poster uh, one of them looked like an 80s hip hop um, movie, like, you know, uh, a break dance or whatever. So I, I just, I, one was tattoos. So I just, I went, I just went a little crazy. And when I did that, I started getting a lot of attention for my work. Um, and then I think the next thing I started doing was, uh, like I did with your cover, when given the option, when I say, what do you want me to draw? And you say, draw whatever you want. My instinct is to draw everybody. <laughs> so... Um, so I, I started doing these covers for Marvel where they were, they were like, okay, well, this is a, a cover for an event book. And I was like, who's in it? And they send me a list. Everybody who's in, it, who's in it. And they're like, choose who you would like on it. And I see the list and it's like 30 characters. And I'm like, I want all of these people on it. So I'm going to put, so I started getting a little bit of a George Perez, like, yes. you know, yeah. which I didn't mind at all. Um, yeah. and it just kind of rolled from there. I, 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 I think I got pretty decent at like having my own voice and I would never shied away from doing the hard work. Um, yeah, I would... no, just just so everybody's clear. I didn't ask Mark to put all those characters on his four covers for me. That was a willing participant because usually I just go do whatever you want, pick whatever you want to do, you're out. Obviously, Mark is way more ambitious than I am at this point in my career. Because I just I marvel at and I I no pun intended but I marvel at those covers where people do 20, 30 people on on a cover even the ones that have you've seen the ones with the you know just heads going across 
like I just go, wow, that's that's impressive, right? I, I, maybe because I'm just like I can't do I can't do. I'm always jealous uh, when people do stuff that I can't do. So well, I, I, when I look at those ones, I go, man, not only the execution, but the dedication and the work, because there's no shortcut to do those. Uh, but you, just, you're a goal. You're a goal for me. Like you know, this is how this. I, I mean, I'm I'm sure I'm not sure if you know how this all came about, but I was doing a um and ask me anything on Twitter. Yeah. And someone said, what what books or characters would you like to work on that you've never got a chance to work on? And I said, Spawn and Hellboy. Yep. And Thomas, out of the blue, emailed me. That's my editor, Thomas Healy, the editor, the editor of the book. And he said, let's let's get something going. And I yeah. said, great. You know, and the next thing I know, I'm having a Zoom call with you. Yeah. And I asked you. No, you I remember know, he texted me and he was <laughs> taught. I just saw Mark Brooks said that he would like to do a Spawn. I'm going to reach out to him. Right. I'm like, what? Mark Brooks? Like Spawn? That's cool. Right. Yes. Yeah. Tell him he can do whatever he wants. Uh, and now and now here we are. So you were gracious enough to give us the four. Uh, how many how many characters are on? I, I don't even know. How uh, many uh, a lot. A lot. I, I want to say that I want to say about 20, but I need to okay. I need to do a full count. I always okay. I always don't do the count to the end. Yeah. And surprise myself because I, I just keep drawing until I run out of room, basically. <laughs> Oh, there! I did. Oh, that's the edge of the page. I guess we're not doing two more. Yes, exactly. <laughs> that, that we're that we're uh, gonna do that. Um, uh, who are some of the artists today um, that you, given that you're a cover artist and you have your techniques, that you're sort of either looking at for inspiration or just that just make you jealous as hell? Oh boy. Um... Inspiration wise, I still go back to the guys that influenced me in the beginning. Um, you know, guys like you, uh, Mark Silvestri is a is a big one for me. Um, yeah, yeah, he's been X -Men. he was my X Men artist. Yeah. Um, and you were always my Spider Man artist. Um, and so, but the guys that, that I look at today that just blow my mind, um, uh, Pepe Larraz is, yeah. is unbelievable. Yeah. Um, Olivier Coipel is, yeah. is 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 amazing. Lanil Yu. Yeah. Um, and these are all guys that I, I I'm I'm happy to say I get to call friends. Like I get, right. I get to hang out with. Them. They're actually they're actually buddies of mine. But I'm constantly just blown away by by the work they do um, and what they're accomplishing. Uh, there's a new guy named um, Dyke Ruin. Um, I think he oh, just yeah. Did, yeah I think he just he's done, some... he's done he's done a couple covers for it. Yeah. Okay, yeah, he's unbelievable. Um, then you know Sarah Pacelli is 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 amazing. I love her stuff. Um, and it just, I feel like, you know, it, it's funny. I'm sure you feel this way too. You get to a certain age where you're not the young gun anymore. You're not the young guy. And I was that way for so long. And I get to the point now where I go to a comic shop and I don't recognize names anymore. Like, I feel like I'm having to learn all these new guys that are coming in. And so I feel like every week I'm discovering some new young hotshot who's, you know, blowing my mind, um, which I love because I think it keeps me on my toes, you know, like I want that. Well, and the thing is, too, the the uh, in today's market, not only is there a big diversity of people internationally, right? Um, but the growth of the female creators coming in too uh, is way more than when I first broke in, right? It was a pretty heavy sort of male-dominated industry, um, at, at least in terms of on the creative side, right? Right. Um, and now you go down Artist Alley, and it's it's pretty heartwarming to just see this big eclectic group of people that you just, you know, from all walks of life that are just in this pool called comic books, right? Exactly. Um, and they all, and it's interesting that, that, I mean, every style isn't suited to do a Superman book, right? right? But every style isn't suited to do a Batman book. I mean, there's some people that I look at, I go, I put them on Batman, never put them on Superman and vice versa, because mm -hmm. I think one's sort of light and one's dark, if you will. Right. Um, but when I walk up the artist alley to see, I'm, I'm always going, like when I'm looking at them, I don't know if you do this, but I look at their artwork and I go, okay, if I was an editor of anything in, in, in the industry, what book would I put them on? Yeah. I, by looking at their art, what book would I put them on if I could basically control the entire industry? Uh, right. No, I absolutely do that. And I do love that the, um, that there is such a diversity in, in style and in storytelling now. Like, I think that 
like the books you're talking about, like that we grew up on, they're still there. You know, th- th- there's still those those, you know, just classic boys comics or whatever, right. you know. Um, but the fact that that Marvel and DC being like the, the main powerhouses of, of comics has diversified their lines so that you do have you still have Deadpool, your kind of silly, violent book. You have Squirrel Girl, which is kind of meant for like a, a, a teen girl audience. You know, you have all these different books that are going to bring in different readers and different yeah. kinds of readers. Yeah, and, yeah, I, well, I, and it's comics, I, 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 I think, is sort of the stepping stone of, you know, there was a time where all I needed was a steady diet of superhero. Right. right? And I was content. Right. I was content with that. You know, cheeseburger and fries. I could eat it, pizza. I could eat it all day long. And then eventually, as I got a little bit older, I wanted to expand sort of my visual diet, right? Mm. Um, and so, you know, odd characters became sort of my favorites. Uh, and then all of a sudden, odd books mm-hmm. became some of my favorites. Again, it was inter- interspersed with all the classic stuff because I still never let go of, of those ones. Oh, cool. but, I, but, it, but, it, but I needed... A, a little bit of a variety in in uh, my diet, and so I, I agree that comic books now. I keep telling people, comic books now that aren't into it are like what used to be blockbuster. You go in, and the format is exactly the same: the round, flat, shiny disc. Right. What's different is the content. So you could go in with your five-year-old, you could go in with yourself, and you could go in with your grandma. Mm-hmm. And at the end, go, hey, in 10 minutes, everybody meet up at the cash register, right? The format's still the same, comic books, right? Right here, words and pi- words and picture on paper. Um, and the, the thing that now defines it is, well, what's the content? And you can get anything from fun kids fair, which is good, all the way to basically the equivalent of R-rated dramas, right? Uh, that were in the movies and everything in between. Yeah, um, I was so- about like a streaming service. Like, yeah. you know, there was a time when there was only three channels or even when cable came out, it's still the, the, the genres were largely the same. But suddenly the streaming started happening and, you know, the, you know what to expect when you go to Netflix and they have all their different categories. And and I mean, who would have thought if you had at, told me that a horror comic was going to be one of the best selling comics of all time, <laughs> I would say no. On TV. On TV. Horror comics don't sell. They're very yeah. niche. And next thing you know, Walking Dead has taken over the industry and is launching all line of merchandise, TV shows, all kinds of things from this one comic book, a horror comic book, you know, drama. Didn't even have any color. Yeah. Black and white. I mean, that's that that's amazing to me. And and, and I think that that's the diversity that that I love. I love that a book like Something is Killing the Children you know, it, it, it is, is, can, can be as popular as it is. Yeah. Um, I love the, and, but I also love the fact that, you know, and I think it did start with you guys because let's face it before you guys started image comic books were like you said, superheroes and yes, spawn is a superhero, I suppose, but you kind of started a horror comic. I mean, it was, it was a really dark, horrific kind of thing i mean a superhero getting his face split open and then tied back together with a shoelace i mean that's not something you saw i I think i think the meaningful the meaningful movements were beyond what the books were that the original founders at image were doing Mm -hmm. it was when that next generation came in Mm -hmm. and they were the people who at times were the one that had been rejected by marvel and dc right or didn't grow up on a steady diet of Marvel and DC, like, you know, the, the, us, us founders were, right? Mm-hmm. So they were coming in with these really cool books that to me had a voice to them that were offering an option, uh, which is all we can do is offer another option that you can, you can be 35, read comic books, and if you don't want to read people in spandex and tights, there's still plenty for you, right? Uh, which, and so I, even my neighbors, I go, look, I know, you know, comic books seem like a weird thing because I think most people that aren't into comic books define comic books as, oh yeah, I read a Superman and Archie comic when I was young, right? And, and, that, and that's sort of the, the sum total. And I'm always going, I'm, I promise you, if you ever took the time and went to a comic book shop and spent 
and in, 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 in a well stock comic shop mm -hmm. and you spent your time it's almost impossible for me to to say that you can walk out and not find anything that was appealing because there's romance there's horror there's fantasy there's adventure there's basically autobiographical stuff right mm -hmm. there's coming of age yeah. there's young love i mean there's all the above that are that's in that store now and mm -hmm. it's gone way beyond what you and i grew up with which was everybody had to be pretty much in tight right um, and and i think that's the health that's the health of the industry so that People like you can come along, show your style, your painting style, and we go for the ride now, right? Because like you said, there wasn't a lot of that because everything had to be almost closer to Kirby than Boris Vallejo, right? Absolutely, was, yeah. you know, Doing something there. So even even people like Alex Ross and yourself, you know, even like we were just saying with, you know, Olivier stuff, uh, that bringing that sense of realism the only guy I really could look at was like Neil Adams. There's like mm. kind of one guy. And now there's so many of them. And I would argue, Mark, and you can speak to this. I would argue what you guys are doing is harder than what, what sort of Jim and Rob and Mark and I do. And here's why I say that. I can just do big flamboyant stuff and Spider-Man, super cool. But I, I could just ignore reality. And I go, I don't really care how the anatomy works. It's just super cool. Mm -hmm. Right. You guys have to still bring the drama and the believability. You got to mix those and make it so that it doesn't look sort of benign. Right. Yeah, I, I think I, I agree with you. It's funny because people say, you know, oh, you, you, your stuff is very realistic. And I'm like, actually, it's really not. My light sources make no sense. My yeah. anatomy is pretty whack. I've just figured out how to draw just realistically enough to fool you. But the a, a lot of it is, I, I, it's kind of a magic trick. It's kind of like you know, it's a little bit of smoke and mirrors in there. Um, but because, but I, I think that it's not a lack of knowledge. I can draw very realistically, but why would I want to do that? Because it's boring. You know, I, 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 I want, uh, I want the shoulder to look like. Technically, it would be popped out of its socket if I actually opposed someone that way, but that's the kind of thing that gives it that energy. It's like, take a pose, take it where it would realistically be able to go, but then take it another 15 degrees, you know, and, and that's where the energy and the motion comes from, even though technically, like I said, it's not going to work in real life, but it's the rendering that I think is what fools yeah. people, yeah. you know, I think if you just saw the line work, you go, okay, that looks pretty whack. And I'm like, yeah, but watch this. And then I'll add the shadows and all this stuff. And they're like, oh, okay, now, now it looks good. Yeah. You know? no, no, you're adding, you're adding uh, reality with your lighting where I was just adding speed lines. Mm -hmm. first, and I was still hanging into the drama of all of it, right? Going, oh my gosh, look at this volume, turn the volume up, speed lines, right? Where, where you're going, they're going, man, could it, could it actually look like that? Right? I mean, what, if this was all real, and then all of a sudden we start seeing things like boys and Watchmen on, you know, on TV, and and all, obviously all, all the superhero movies now, right? And, oh, yeah. and and they're obviously they're way closer in terms of what they look like when they're in costumes to what you and a group of others do, uh, given that they've got all these tremendous special effects around them, right? And yeah. so that's the trick there. You've got real actors. But you put all the all the crazy, which is basically what you're doing. You're, you're saying, "Hey, I'll give you enough realism that I'm tricking your eye that it's real." But I'm actually doing way more fantasy than you think I'm doing. Absolutely, yeah. You know, I, I think that um, I, I think that that's that's the key. Like, and I actually heard that the first time from Ad, from uh, Adam Hughes because I was talking to him. This is one of, early on in my career, and I was like, "Oh, but you draw so realistically." He's like, "No, I don't." He's like, I draw just realistically enough to fool you. But he goes, but so much of my stuff is just made up. And he goes, it's not realism. If anything, it's hyper-realism yeah. or, or something approaching surrealism, you know. And, and and I've always, even when I started trying to go more realistic in my artwork, I always tried to keep that in mind. I was like, keep pushing the anatomy. Keep pushing it. Because no one wants to see some static image. And people can tell when you have reference to photo too much they can tell because yeah, yeah. photos are static 
and yeah. you don't want your artwork to look static. It needs to have motion. People need to feel like you're capturing somebody in the middle of a of an action, you know, and that doesn't work so well if you try to draw from a picture. So uh, as we wind down, uh, Mark, a, a question. Um, are there any creative itches that you hope to tackle before you basically take your last breath someday? Yeah, there is. Um, what are they? I want to do a creator own pretty pretty badly. Um, I have an like, idea. Like, like, and write it, write it, write it too or not? Yes. Yeah. I'd like to write it. Um, I'd probably bring on a, a, a co-writer, a co-creator, um, yeah. just... Uh, some just someone I respect that can uh, even if they just come on as an editorial capacity, just someone to kind of check me, you know, because I I'd want it to be somewhat successful. But I realized that it being my first creator on book, I'm not doing it to try to be not to, doing it to be rich, I'm not doing it to be successful, I'm doing it because creatively it's something I really need to do. I feel like I want to do it, even if it comes out and people think it's garbage, I have to do it. <laughs> You know, so um, so yeah. Some of those ideas you have some of those ideas tucked away in folders and stuff that you that every now and then come and sort of tickle you back I your do. head. I've actually done some drawings of them already. It's, uh, cool. And it's not a superhero thing. It's more no. of a political intrigue um, with a little bit of a uh, fantasy um, kind of a conspiracy type type book. Um, but uh, but yeah, I have I have something in mind. I want to do it. I've been working on it over the last few years. Um, so uh, I, I assume Image will be getting a pitch at some point for this. <laughs> I'm gonna make sure to send it to you. You put in a good word for me. Yeah, well, 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 well thank you. I like it. We're, we're only, Image is only as good as the collective whole of the people that are sort of joining it, right? Mm -hmm. um, I had this moment, Mark, for, for what it's worth. We had a, years ago, we had a Image convention or expo, or I think it was called. Mm -hmm. And it was all things image. It was in, uh, I think, the Bay Area in California. And I remember I had this like epiphany where I was walking around and like it was a real convention, but it was mm -hmm. all related to image. And I'm like, man, I know that image is going to be healthy and be around for a long time because right now, when I see everything that I see, the original six founders could all get hit by a bus tomorrow and it would not really make that much of a difference to what's in this room right um which is to me as a you know again like proud parent you you always want like the next generation to outlive you right and go and do bigger and better stronger right so i go man if you can you know it's weird we talked about at the beginning trying to make yourself relevant right mm -hmm. Now there's a little bit of going, well, how do, how do I, how do I sort of get to the point where there's so much talent around that I actually become irrelevant, right? Mm -hmm. That, that I think is actually healthy for image comic books going for the next couple, you know, centuries, if not longer, right? People like you, people mm -hmm. like you and, you know, 40, 50, 60 other books we put out every month, putting mm -hmm. their collective ideas down so that that option is still a beacon on the hill, if you will, of saying, hey, if, you know, when you get tired of that or that option, there's another one over there, right? You don't have to come. You don't have to stay forever. You don't have to do 340 issues like I do with Spawn. Um, <laughs> but if you want to come and play, the, the sandbox is up over there. Everybody's sort of welcome to, to come on board, you know. Hopefully, yeah, well, you hopefully we'll, get to, we'll get to see your, your, sand, your sand tools. Uh, someday, over on our I, side. I really hope so. I, I, because and, and to to your to your credit, though, I will say you say you could go away. I, 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 I can't agree. You are, will always be the Todd father, and you. you no, no, no. I, I know that. I know that the. I know that us, the founders, made an impact. I'm not. Mm -hmm. I'm not dismissing that or trying to be overly humble. I'm just saying that the time will come when we won't be here, and I think that, like any other good sort of idea, the idea is going to be strong enough to carry on without the original people, right? Oh, absolutely. That's, I, I that's the victory. When people say, what are you most proud of? It's that, it's that, mm -hmm. right? That image is going to outlive us. That's cool, right? Because we didn't know it was going to last a year when we first started. Mm -hmm. um, and now I, I, I can see past my lifetime of saying, wow. And then 
the next walking dead walks in the door right. and it's somebody who just looking for a break and boom and we we started all over again which is cool image is a powerhouse i mean image was obviously it started huge and then it was you know a, a lot of people came in and it was like what's going to happen and now you look at it and it's it, it, it's it's massive people dream about doing work and image and that's all you could ever hope for right yep. so it's just have that kind of demand that the people want that eye on their book i want that eye on my book you know yeah. that 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 would be a dream come true for me because i have been reading spawn since issue one you know i have all the all, all the founding books you know from the beginning and that eye was always something i wanted to achieve Okay, so Mark, maybe at some point then I'll die. You can do your book. You go for 300 issues. They'll all look at you. Then you died and somebody else comes through 300. Just keep going for a long time. I like that idea. For a long time. I like that idea. <laughs> all right. Uh, you got anything else? Any uh, sort of points of uh, news, information, tips you want to give everybody here before we uh, wave goodbye? Yeah, uh, please pick up my issues of Spawn this month. I'm, I am <laughs> incredibly proud of these. And I purposely spread them across four four covers uh, as one image to force you to buy all four. Yeah, so you they're interconnect. They're interconnecting four. basically. So yes, they all interconnect. If you, want, so. if you want the whole experience of Mark, you got it. Yeah, he, what he's saying, you got to get all four because they interconnect. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, but also, I'm the cover artist for Immortal X Men. Please check that out. Yep. Uh, you could follow me on Twitter at, at Mark Brooks Art. Um, so please give me a follow. Uh, I, I I think I'm pretty entertaining on Twitter. I've been told. So, um, so give me a follow there. And uh, otherwise, that's it. I just want to say thank you to you for this opportunity. It yeah, was, no, I appreciate you coming out and hanging out with us. I know the the fans enjoy hearing from different people. Here, here's the thing about the internet that's super cool: is it is that you don't have to then be at a convention, mm -hmm. right? Right. Not so people can stay at home, save themselves an air air ticket, or even more impressive, if you live in another country. You go, wow, I can I can listen to different people talk about different things. Right. And I can stay in Portugal and Spain and Argentina and, and Japan and Korea, whatever it's like and, and get the information still. Uh so the the internet uh, again, I know sometimes used wrong people, you know, it, but the internet's just a tool and every tool used right is magnificent. So uh, I'm glad I'm glad we're able to take our art to the world and 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 more importantly see see the world show us their art because it, it that was way harder to find um absolutely yeah i i agree i always say that the uh the the the, the artists coming up today are coming up at an amazing time because they have resources that you and i would only have dreamed about at the time when we were trying to break in you know and so you know don't use it as a crutch but absolutely take advantage of it because it's there at your fingertips in a way that you have no idea how much we would have killed for it back in the day. <laughs> and and last one, if you if you don't at least make the attempt, like Mark and I did, you you, you can't find a break if you don't take a shot, right? So so everybody out there that's even thinking about it, right? You you'll never you never know when your your time comes if you don't make the effort. So uh, we encourage everybody to go out there and be ten times better than Mark and I, right? This, Please, we're. we're we're hoping we're hoping to be proud parents of going, man, look at the look at the new generation. They're awesome. Mm -hmm. so, all right, Mark, appreciate you joining us today. Taking Thanks, some time Todd. out of your day. Uh, very insightful. Hopefully uh, we'll get to meet in person and uh, best of luck uh, for Absolutely. the rest of your career here. Thanks, Todd. Good seeing you. All right. Be good.